so thank you for having me. Uh, it's a, a pleasure and a privilege. And so I've uh, divided my talk on the future of religion into three areas. The first area is uh, going to be growth trends in the major religions. I'm going to be relying mainly on the Pew Center Research uh, Study. It was done in 2015. Uh, then I'm going to offer uh, some of my observations and speculations about spiritual trends at the group level. And then I'll conclude with observations and speculations uh, on spiritual trends at the individual level. So let me begin with the, the Pew Center's uh, report. It's called The Future of Religions, Population Growth Projections, 2010 to 2050. So it's over a 40-year period, four decades. And these projections take into account the following factors. The current size and geographic distribution of the major religions, age differences, fertility and mortality rates, international migration, as well as conversion patterns, which they also refer to as religious switching, switching in and out of different religions. So I like to lay the kind of uh, uh, numbers groundwork for my talk. The rest of my talk, I promise, won't be about numbers, but I thought it would be important to look at the demographics of the religious scene in 2050. So in terms of an overview, uh, there are a number of interesting uh, points. One is that the number of Muslims will be nearly equal to that of Christians around the world. Also, the uh, atheists, agnostics, and other people who do not affiliate, uh, their numbers will be increasing in the United States, uh, in Europe, and in other developed countries, but will be declining in other areas of the world. So uh, overall, there'll be a... Uh, uh, a smaller share of the population. Uh, the Buddhist religion, it's expected to be a, uh, uh, about the same size in 2050. Uh, uh, Hinduism and uh, uh, Judaism, the, uh, the populations are expected to increase somewhat. Uh, Europe should be around 10% Muslim in 2050. Uh, India will continue to have a majority of Hindu practitioners, uh, but it will also become the home of the world's largest uh, Islamic population. Um, and that's, uh, that will uh, exceed that of Indonesia. Uh, more at home, in terms of the United States, uh, Christians will decline from being three quarters of the population to about two thirds. Uh, Judaism will no longer be the largest non Christian. Uh, group, uh, that place will be taken by Muslims. Also, 40% uh, of Christians uh, will be living in Sub-Sahara Africa. So that's a pretty big difference in the religious scene that we have today. I wanted to drill down into a couple of other statistics, which are interesting, at least I think so, um, that uh, in 2010, there were 2.2 billion Christians, uh, and that's expected to increase to 2.9 in 2050. That's a 35% increase. In 2010, the number of Muslims was 1.6 billion, and that's expected to increase to 2.8 billion, which is a 73% increase. So there's going to be a huge increase uh, in uh, the number of Muslims. Uh, Another interesting category is the unaffiliated category, which includes the atheists, the agnostics, and other uh, individuals who are not affiliated. Uh, in 2010, uh, there were 1.1 billion unaffiliated. That's expected to increase to 1.2 billion, which is not a large increase, about 9%. Um, the number of Hindus is expected to increase about 34%. The number of Buddhists will remain about flat, uh, and there will be a 16% increase in the number of Jews. So uh, the last uh, uh, series of statistics will be uh, to talk a little bit about religious switching and also about some numbers here at home in the United States. So uh, probably the most interesting category is uh, religious switching in terms of the unaffiliated. So it's uh, projected that 97 million uh, people will switch into the unaffiliated category 
and 35.6 million will switch out for a net gain of 61 uh, and a half million. Okay, so that's, that's actually the largest uh, increase. So that suggests that there is going to be uh, uh, more moving out of organized religions than moving in, at least in terms of uh, 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 compared to any one other major religion. Uh, the other religion that shows the most number of individuals moving in as opposed to moving out is uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, it's, it's expected that there's going to be 2.6 million switching into Islam and 9.4 million switching out for a net gain of 3.2 um, million. So in terms of some of the stats at home, a 2017 Pew Center uh, study indicated that 27% of U.S. adults identify as spiritual but not religious, and this is an 8% gain in five years. The percent is even higher for young people. So for uh, people between 18 and 49, it's about 30%. Uh, and, and the highest percentage is among those Americans who have at least some college education, and there it's 32% consider themselves spiritual but not religious. The last category that I'll mention in terms of statistics is the uh, area of interfaith marriage of mixed religion families. Uh, a 2015 study showed that 39% of U.S. adults uh, who married uh, since uh, 2010 are in interfaith marriages. That's doubling of the number of interfaith marriages prior to uh, 1960. So there's been a, a doubling between 1960 and, and 2010. Also, a, a 2016 study showed that 21% of adults uh, were raised in mixed religion families, and the percent is rising every year. So that gives a little sense of the uh, both global and local demographic shifts. So now I'd like to focus in on my own observations and speculations about spiritual trends at the group level. So I wanted to begin with uh, the universe story. Uh, Swim and Barry have a, a book by that name, and this idea of uh, the cosmos evolving, there being three cosmogenetic principles. The first being differentiation, uh, this idea of the, of the whole diversifying itself. Uh, also, autopoiesis, this notion of self-making, that is that any individual or group tends to persist and uh, sustain itself. And then uh, a counterbalancing force, which is that of communion, of uh, entities coming together in communion and connection. So I think we'll see those three uh, principles operating at the level of religion as well, in terms of there being a further differentiation uh, within and among uh, religions and spiritual traditions. There's also going to be a, an effort for uh, particular uh, groups to persist and sustain themselves, as well as to form new connections uh, with others. In general, I think there's going to be this uh, dance of unity and diversity uh, and this movement toward uh, greater complexity and at the same time, uh, greater interconnectivity, both at the multilateral level and kind of multidimensional level. So there'll be uh, more connections at the same level and also between levels. Also, uh, bringing things uh, from more of a cosmic perspective down to uh, a historic perspective, I think we will continue to see a, uh, the historical dialectic between conservative forces and liberal forces, or between reactionary forces and progressive forces. I think th those uh, two forces will continue to exist, but they will take on a different character as time proceeds. Uh, but I do think that there is a kind of uh, centripetal and, and centri centrifugal uh, uh, balance that's going on here, and uh, the nature of those poles will change, but nonetheless, there's going to be a conserving pole and a, a more liberating or progressive uh, pole. In terms of uh, uh, this issue of differentiation, I think there's going to be a continued splitting and splintering 
within the major religions, there's going to be a multiplication of denominations and sub-denominations. And there's also going to be new alliances uh, among uh, denominations and religions. So there's both things are going to be happening, this, this kind of splintering and this forming of new connections. Um, as always, the, the splintering will come down to disagreements on major issues, as we see now in terms of issues, for example, of abortion rights or uh, gender rights and so on. Uh, the nature of the splintering issues will change, but certainly there will always be these kinds of issues that, that split, uh, split groups. I also think there's going to be uh, continuing alliances uh, among religious, political, and economic elites. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, conservative. So I think, for example, if we're talking about uh, a liberal government, we would tend to see uh, more support of that liberal government by uh, liberal spiritual uh, elites. So there's going to be both uh, a kind of harmonizing between the uh, the uh, the religious elites and the political elites, as well as as a clashing when the uh, the basic ideology differs. There's also going to be a continued uh, growing of theocracies, as well as a, a, a toppling of theocracies. So I think that tension will continue uh, and uh, perhaps escalate in ways that we can't even imagine. We've seen over the last uh, two centuries or more this uh, uh, dialogue between East and West. And at this stage, we are really in a stage of uh, deep cross-fertilization. I think that that trend will continue and uh, even increase. Uh, we can see it within the, the various integral approaches, but we even see it in other kinds of uh, 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 sort of non-integral approaches. I do expect increased uh, urbanization. So we've seen this uh, trend for uh, at least uh, three centuries, this uh, increasing urbanization. That's going to mean that uh, different religious groups, different spiritual groups are going to have more contact, which is also going to be more conflict, as well as more opportunities for creative connections and cross-fertilization. So I think both things will happen. At the same time, the kind of counterpole to that is um, increased ruralization, the kind of movement back to the land. Um, back to the earth, uh, a uh, embracing of indigenous practices. So I think both things are going to be happening. Uh, movement into cities, movement out of cities. I also think there'll be uh, some middle ground there. So within urban areas, there's going to be more greening, more parks, more trees, more uh, availability of wild nature. And it may also be the case that small cities will pop up in uh, largely rural areas. So I think there will be that kind of uh, balancing in both directions. So uh, I've, I've already alluded to this idea of that I think that, that uh, religion and spirituality will penetrate uh, really all sectors of society. Uh, in terms of uh, mainstream religion itself, I expect to see much more of an emphasis on the spiritual traditions uh, the esoteric traditions, the mystical traditions. Uh, these had all been really the practice of, of a few, oftentimes the practice of, of the elite. Uh, and now many mainstream religions and denominations are opening their arms to their own uh, mystical and spiritual traditions, as well as sometimes to others. So I think we'll see more of that. Uh, we'll see more of the influence of uh, of meditation and mindfulness, more focus on transformative practices uh, outside of the traditional ones. Um, and I think we'll also see a new focus on silence, especially since we're living in a world that gets noisier and noisier and, and busier and busier and faster and faster. And I think uh, the uh, yearning for silence will uh, become so loud, so to speak, uh, that uh, we start building in more opportunities for silence at home, at work, and in other uh, sectors of, of, of human society. So in terms of spirituality uh, penetrating a business, we can already see it happening. Uh, there's a whole uh, spirit at work movement. Uh, clearly, mindfulness has uh, become uh, a, 
uh, almost a household world in, in the uh, household word in the business world. Uh, so we'll see uh, more emphasis on on mindfulness and other kinds of uh, transformative practices. I think we might also see a, a more of an emphasis on retreats, both off-site retreats and on-site retreats. Uh, there may also be uh, more, for example, meditation or prayer rooms that are set aside uh, in different organizations. There may also be an opportunity, for example, uh, every hour that that uh, you can take a, a retreat, a five-minute retreat within the hour to be silent or to meditate, uh, to some, in some way unhook from being uh, totally engaged in, in work. So I think, though on the one hand, that seems to work against capitalistic pressures for more productivity and more time and more energy and so on, I think we, uh, people will start getting to the breaking point where it's demanded that there is more spaciousness, more silence, uh, more uh, nurturing uh, energy that's built into the workplace. We've already started to see the uh, penetration of meditation into education. So, I belong to a number of organizations that are involved with education, uh, with meditation uh, in educational settings. For the most part, that meditation has been presented in a secular way, um, and uh, that will continue for sure. But we know that if you introduce meditative practices in the classroom, that will inevitably have a spiritual impact on many students. So uh, spirit will be brought to educational settings through the door of uh, meditation and mindfulness. I also think that uh, we'll see more of the uh, use of actual spiritual practices in the classroom. Uh, I did a paper in which I interviewed a number of constitutional law professors, and they all said it was legitimate to introduce spiritual teachings and practices if a number of criteria are met. Uh, it should be uh, comparative, pluralistic, non-coercive, critical, in other words, critical thinking can be applied, non-proselytizing and voluntary. So as long as those conditions are present, there isn't an issue of violation of church and state. So I think as that kind of uh, information becomes more widely known, as professors feel more emboldened to, uh, to do that kind of thing, I think we'll, we'll see it. Uh, a number of studies have shown that there is a huge thirst among undergraduates uh, for introducing more spiritual ideas and practices into their university and college educations. So there's this huge demand on part of the students and also a huge reluctance on the part of professors. Professors themselves may be very uh, spiritual or religious personally, but they've been loath to uh, introduce uh, spirit and uh, religious notions into the classroom for fear of violating separation of church and state. So that's a laudable and necessary uh, concern. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's important to really get out the word that uh, it is possible to share these practices and teachings in the classroom as long as they are presented uh, in the appropriate way. So. Uh, more generally, I expect to see spirituality to uh, penetrate all the all four quadrants. Uh, I see a continuing and intensifying uh, uh, of science and spirituality uh, cross cross fertilization. Um, a uh, for example, let's 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 talk about religion, um, uh, religious groups. I, I see a continuing uh, embracing. Of, of evolution and of uh, cosmogenesis into the creation stories told by the, the mainstream religions. I also see a, uh, an incorporation uh, of uh, a science of, of contemplation into the, in, into the sciences themselves. So uh, the use of scientific uh, techniques, knowledge, and practices in order to 
uh, both study and shape uh, contemplation and other meditative practices. Uh, we, were, uh, we were already seeing the use of neuroscience to help refine uh, contemplative practices to build uh, contemplative approaches that take into account how the brain operates. Uh, this can uh, serve to uh, intensify uh, the impact of these practices. Uh, and also, science can also help us to uh, uh, customize practices for individuals uh, based on their own, I can, I, we could call it their own uh, ontic signature, so to speak, or their own ontic uh, fingerprint. So we all have a, a beingness, a, a mind, body, soul, a heart, spirit, uh, and our, our, our beingness has, has a, a unique character. And uh, I think science can help us in terms of tailoring some of these transformative practices so that they meet us where we're at and where we need to go. I do think that with the uh, assistance of science that we're gonna be able to develop more powerful and briefer kinds of co contemplative and transformative practices. And we're already do, doing so at the present. I also think so that as we uh, have uh, different technologies and processes that optimize the brain, it's also going to help to optimize spiritual expression, experience, and action. So overall, it's going to uh, expand our, our human capacity, our human potential. I do think that the computers will play a role in this uh, process of, of uh, ontic diagnosis and treatment. Um, I also think in terms of science, there's going to be uh, the development of new entheogens. Uh, which will uh, uh, increase our understanding of the uh, farther reaches of uh, spiritual experience and spiritual action, because I think that there's often been too much of an emphasis on spiritual experience. Um, I, I was born in a tradition that emphasizes action, uh, my, my Jewish background, this idea that uh, words are important. Obviously, wor the word is very important in, in Judaism. But there's also an emphasis on, on the deed even being more important, this idea of bringing words into action, bringing teachings into action, bringing experience into action, bringing values into action. So I think entheogens will open us up to new kinds of experiences which we will be able to actualize uh, in a way that will hopefully uh, uplift individuals, communities, uh, and the planet. I also think that uh, uh, there will be a uh, an emphasis on a greater emphasis on uh, ecological issues. Uh, we've we've seen that growing over the last seventy years, uh, and I think it will continue to grow. Even though there are uh, a number of people out there who are denying uh, the impact of our actions on the globe, uh, most of us um, can see that uh, our actions and our, our our businesses and industries and uh, technologies and science uh, has a huge impact uh, on the earth, communities, on the climate. Uh, so uh, we'll see an ecological perspective incorporated even more into spiritual and religious traditions. In terms of tech per se, um, I think there will be a proliferation of transformative technologies. Uh, we already see the proliferation of apps uh, involving meditation, other kinds of spiritual teachings. Um, uh, certainly there's going to be uh, uh, more virtual reality uh, uh, that will be uh, used to support uh, spiritual experience, spiritual action, spiritual growth. Uh, there will be uh, virtual communities, there already are virtual communities, but this will continue to grow. Um, also, uh, spiritual experiences that are enhanced by various kinds of uh, 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 technologies, as well as virtual retreats. We're also going to see, uh, we've, we're already seeing that, uh, uh, that the, the human machine uh, uh, um, hybridization is already taking place in terms of prostheses and uh, now prostheses can be wired up to the brain. So uh, as time goes on, there's going to be uh, an increased meshing of human beings and machines, human beings and computers, and that will have a, uh, a huge impact on the nature of spirituality. 
I think technology is, is going to uh, be sort of double-edged in terms of, on the one hand, uh, supporting a, a transcendence of the body, and also it can be used to support a movement into the body. My own uh, view of spirituality is that it needs to be deeply embodied, and I'm also uh, deeply troubled by the ways in which uh, technology has alienated us from our bodies. Uh, and so uh, I think that trend of alienation will continue, but it will also be a counter trend of how to make use of technologies to bring us back into our bodies. Um, and uh, to use technologies to help us uh, reduce that experience of speed and distance that's being created by the current uh, information society. I also think that uh, space exploration is going to have an impact on spirituality. Um, uh, we'll be going to uh, Mars one of these days and other planets. Uh, and I think that those experiences will shape uh, uh, spiritual expressions here on the planet. And as we develop uh, colonies on other planets, the forms of spirituality that grow up there will be uh, things that we can't even imagine. So I think uh, uh, spirituality will become more uh, geocentric, Mars-centric, uh, solar-centric, and cosmocentric. Uh, at a more mundane level, you could say, um, I think that there will be uh, certainly a, a continuation and increase of uh, interreligious dialogue, worship, and collaborative projects, uh, and that will support uh, 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 understanding uh, and growth and peace. And at the same time, there's going to be a a continuation and an escalation of interreligious violence and wars. I do think there's only going to be modest uh, increases in shadow work uh, at the organization level. Um, I've been involved in many very progressive organizations. And uh, what I've discovered is that uh, no matter how progressive or how value-centered you are, um, uh, organizations are extremely resistant to shadow work, extremely resistant to acknowledging their flaws and failures, extremely resistant to receiving feedback, even uh, positive constructive feedback. So um, uh, I think there will continue to be that kind of resistance. And at the same time, uh, both individuals and groups will be calling for more and more uh, shadow work at both the, uh, the group level and the individual level. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think that there will be uh, an increased uh, individualization, customization, and diversification of spiritual teachings, practices, and paths. So let me turn to the final area, my own observations and speculations about spiritual trends at the individual level. I should just say a little bit about my background, uh, just so you understand uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, I've been involved in uh, interreligious education, counseling, and the arts for about two and a half decades. I've been on a spiritual path really all of my life. My birth religion is uh, Judaism. Uh, I was on the path to becoming a rabbi in rabbinical school. I had a crisis in faith and realized that I could no longer confine my spiritual life to one tradition, and in fact, a, 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 tradition, a, a tradition that was uh, uh, affirmed the, uh, that the whole Bible was from God, I, I began to question that. And so I initially walked away from Judaism, not just from Judaism, really from all of spirit. I really uh, threw out the baby with the bathwater, and I was kind of a, uh, a bitter atheist uh, for about five years, and then my own spirituality came bubbling back. And then I began initially exploring the arts as a way of uh, uh, looking at uh, various uh, non-dogmatic approaches and more creative approaches to spirituality, uh, and then began to explore the world's religions and even uh, discovered that there was a progressive form of Jewish mysticism, uh, the Jewish renewal movement. So uh, at, at this point in my life, uh, I'm in an interfaith marriage uh, I consider myself interreligious and integral, uh, and I've been uh, profoundly influenced by uh, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, Sufism, and as well as Christianity. So I've been involved uh, 
been working with many, many uh, different communities. I also have close connections uh, with various Hindu uh, communities. So uh, uh, these observations are rooted both in my own research as well as in my own work with individuals. Mostly my work uh, with individuals in the Bay Area, uh, though I have to say that uh, many of my students have come from around the country and from around the world. So uh, uh, I do have a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, kind of uh, individual perspectives from a, from a global sense, but I'd say more limited. Most of the individuals, the hundreds or thousands of individuals I've worked with have been from the U.S. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I mentioned this uh, increase in spiritual but uh, in, in uh, spiritual but not religious, I think that's certainly uh, going to continue in a significant way. Uh, an increase in uh, those who identify as secular, atheistic, or none. Uh, and I also think that there's going to be um, many people who may identify as secular but um, are able to embrace uh, spiritual experience and spiritual uh, technologies without calling them such. So in other words, what I've seen from my own uh, work is that um, some of the most profoundly spiritual people I know consider themselves atheists. Uh, and they, they have profound spiritual experiences, profound values, uh, spiritual values, uh, and yet they don't want to call them spiritual. They don't even necessarily want to call them sacred. But in discussing their lives uh, with me and with others, I can see that uh, uh, they may not label those experiences and actions uh, spiritual, but um, in my own understanding, they are. And so I think we'll see more of that. Um, I think there'll also be an increased focus on the sanctification of daily life. Uh, for too long, uh, religion has been kind of confined to uh, churches and synagogues and, and mosques and ashrams. Uh, but uh, I think there's been a new movement toward uh, uh, honoring and uh, experiencing the sacred in daily life. Um, I certainly uh, find that in my own uh, Buddhist meditation practice, my mindfulness practice. It's also a part of my own uh, Jewish mystical practice. So this idea of uh, finding uh, divine sparks everywhere uh, in, in one's daily life. Um, being able to see and honor the divine in every person and everything and to sort of draw that out. Uh, so I've, I've noticed that that trend toward the um, uh, uh, finding the sacred in the ordinary has, is definitely something that uh, appeals to uh, the younger generations. I also think we're going to continue to see a use of non-spiritual language to describe spiritual phenomena, or what were formerly considered spiritual religious phenomena. So for example, uh, we have language now of self-actualization, a lot of terms from psychology, the whole self, holistic, and so on. We use a lot of uh, terms now in psychology uh, that really have uh, uh, spiritual or religious roots. Uh, and so uh, I, I think we'll continue to see uh, the use of terms from other disciplines, especially the, the health sciences, used to describe a spiritual and religious phenomena. I wanted to uh, conclude uh, with, uh, on the one hand, observations of the different clusterings within uh, those individuals who identify in some way as uh, interreligious. Uh, and then I wanted to speak a little bit about my own sort of sense of, of an ideal spirituality. Um, so in my own work and in my studies, I've been able to uh, identify a, a proliferation of terms that speak about uh, individuals who draw on more than one religious tradition. Terms like interfaith, interreligious, interspiritual, multi-faith, multi-religious, religiously hybrid, religiously mixed, multiple religious belonging, ecumenical, inclusively pluralistic, pluralistically inclusive, religiously complementary, spiritually integrative, spiritually integral, religiously syncretic, religiously symbiotic, spiritually fluid, religiously hyphenated, 
and spiritual but not religious. So uh, certainly all of these terms have been used in different ways. They have uh, being assigned different meanings and definitions, and sometimes they've been used uh, synonymously. So I've noticed that uh, if we look at the, uh, the population of those uh, who draw on more than one religion, including uh, the sciences and the arts, I would, I would add, um, I've noticed uh, seven clusterings. And so I wanted to speak about those. Uh, I discussed those in a forthcoming uh, book of mine on, on interreligious spirituality. So the first cluster uh, are those involved in interreligious dialogue and other activities. So that's been the more traditional sense of what interreligious or interfaith is about. Uh, this, I, I, <clears throat> this idea of having dialogues together, of engaging in social projects together, and occasionally engaging in joint worship. Um, I think we will continue to see this. I, it will probably be an expansion of efforts in this direction. We've seen a long history of interreligious dialogue. Uh, it hasn't always been just a dialogue. Sometimes there have been uh, debates and disputations that have uh, led to uh, violence and other forms of aggression. Uh, but uh, really since the, uh, the 19th century, uh, we've started to see uh, 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 dialogues that have been uh, much more uh, uh, peaceful and much more uh, authentic. And uh, in 1893 was the, uh, the first meeting of the Parliament of World Religions, and that really inaugurated uh, interreligious dialogue at the global level. So prior to that, these dialogues were generally between two religions at a time. Uh, but it was the, uh, the Parliament that really launched uh, uh, interreligious inter dialogue at this global level. And it was also uh, an occasion when uh, several uh, very powerful uh, Eastern uh, masters uh, were able to uh, uh, share their teachings to a Western audience. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Vivekananda was a, a kind of sensation uh, at the conference. So the uh, second cluster uh, has to do with uh, those who are committed to interreligious inter a friendship, partnership, or marriage. I've already uh, mentioned that. Um, and uh, I think uh, the trends indicate that there's going to be an increase uh, in uh, mixed uh, marriages, uh, certainly uh, in terms of friendships. I see that a lot in, uh, in the younger generation, um, uh, people having friends that, that cross uh, religious lines, that cross uh, ethnic lines, uh, that cross uh, other kinds of lines. So I think we will, we will continue to see that, uh, um, especially among young people. Um, I think uh, there, will, there will be the continued challenge of um, how to, uh, what kind of education, uh, what kind of spiritual education to have uh, in a mixed family. Um, will it be a, uh, an education that, that blends the two religions? Will it be choosing one or the other? Will it be some kind of uh, more uh, global approach or integral approach to spirituality. So these are the kinds of issues that families will grapple with, those who want to uh, uh, maintain and develop a, a kind of family spiritual life. These are the kinds of questions they'll have to grapple with. So another cluster has to do with those who are devoted to a spiritual path that contains elements of two or more religions. So there's, there's a, um, a concerted effort to draw uh, practices and teachings from those religions. Um, and uh, so, for example, we already see uh, cases of, of people who call themselves uh, uh, Boo Jews uh, or uh, Jufis. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to see more of that, those kind of hybrid uh, identities. Um, in some cases, individuals will completely practice both traditions, but in most cases, uh, there will be more selectivity. Uh, I think what I've observed is those people who pursue a kind of interreligious life um, realize that uh, living a kind of uh, purely traditional approach is no longer possible. So um, uh, they tend to be more selective in what they draw from their own birth religion as well as what they draw from other religions. So I see that being more the norm um, 
and uh, it being rather unusual where an individual would choose to uh, completely practice two different religions. I, I have some friends who do that, but I think that's a, a very rare uh, situation uh, and will probably continue to be a rare situation. Uh, another cluster has to do with um, individuals who affirm a spiritual uh, identity that is more expansive and inclusive than, uh, than their own birth religion. So uh, these individuals uh, place humanity before their uh, Jewish or Christian or, or Muslim identity. Uh, and I think this is going to uh, happen increasingly. Uh, a fifth uh, cluster has to do with uh, those who espouse a core set of spiritual ideas and values uh, shared by many spiritual, especially mystical traditions. Um, certainly, uh, Matt Fox has referred to this as a uh, deep ecumenism. There, there are other, uh, many other names for this approach. Uh, for example, Wayne Teasdale talks about uh, interspirituality, uh, and uh, so I think this 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 process will will continue. Uh, another uh, uh, cluster are those emphasizing an ultimate reality that encompasses, inspires, and unites all religions. Um, and so uh, this approaches a kind of uh, universal spirituality, but it's a, it's a universal spirituality that will manifest in unique ways. So it's not going to be a kind of monolithic uh, universal spirituality. Um, the, the, the sense of, uh, of uh, kind of the universal spirit will be embodied in as many ways as there are individuals and as there are groups. Um, sometimes this is talked about. Uh, uh, different paths of the same mountain, different wells uh, leading to the same underground spring, different rays of one sun, different uh, fingers of the same hand, different waves of the same sea, different prisms uh, of a uh, refracting a single light, different mirrors uh, reflecting one source. All of these have different implications. So the metaphors really indicate that there's going to be a, a variety of ways uh, in which that oneness is going to be expressed and understood. Um, uh, many people may opt for the, the perennial philosophy that's, that's at the heart of uh, integral uh, spirituality as uh, presented by Wilbur and others. Um, others uh, may uh, embrace uh, the approach, for example, that's uh, advocated by Ferrer in terms of a participatory uh, approach. Uh, so, um, so I expect to see a, a variety of uh, uh, of approaches that uh, embrace a, a kind of more uh, universal uh, experience of spirit. The, uh, the last uh, cluster are those individuals devoted to a post-denominational integral spiritual path, uh, like the one that uh, uh, Wilbur and others speak about, and that emphasizes the uh, omnipresence and, um, and ongoing creativity of spirit. Um, I think the the arts will also play a, a big role uh, in this uh, uh, among these individuals. It, it already is uh, uh, bringing a, a kind of contemplative or prayerful consciousness to uh, art making, to ritual making, uh, will help uh, different uh, uh, individuals and groups to evolve uh, spiritually. Um, I think there will be um, uh, kind of continued and expanded, expanded uh, use of dream work. Uh, to uh, explore the spiritual realm. So I wanted to uh, uh, sort of conclude, uh, I mean, essentially I, I embrace a, an integral approach to spirituality, um, but uh, I have to say that uh, I'm not completely comfortable uh, with, um, uh, uh, oftentimes I, I hear people sort of grading each other or, you know, so-and-so was in this level or that level and so on. So um, I kind of cringe a bit when I when I kind of hear that uh, that labeling going on a little bit too easily, uh, but I do acknowledge that there are uh, different uh, levels of inclusivity, um, and uh, obviously uh, different uh, sort of states and stages of um, of consciousness. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, while acknowledging these differences or these holarchies. Um, I think for me, the, uh, the ultimate is, is a kind of sense of uh, ultimate equality, 
that we are we are all uh, manifestations or expressions of the infinite, uh, and therefore fundamentally uh, there is there's a fundamental equality. Um, and uh, I'm also reminded that Meister Eckhart said that um, love requires equality. That whenever there's inequality, that there's a kind of diminishment of love. And so for me, it's about holding the paradox of, on the one hand, uh, uh, ultimate equality, and on the other hand, an acknowledgement of differences that uh, uh, can be looked at in terms of, uh, of levels or holarchies. So as far as my own uh, uh, kind of idealized uh, approach, um, I decided to be kind of fanciful. Um, I was meditating actually earlier in the day, and I had, um, uh, I, I got, uh, I started riffing on, on the letter I. And so this, this notion of this movement from the small I to the big I, from the ego to a, uh, uh, the divine I, uh, as the Bible says, eh, yeah, I share, eh, yeah, I shall be what I shall be. So uh, for me, uh, that's the kind of ultimate to, to move from a kind of egocentric to a, a, a um, divine centric um, uh, uh, perspective, uh, and so I thought, let's play with let's play with I. So uh, one feature of this spirituality is that it's inclusive, uh, that it's open, um, that it's uh, integral and integrative, uh, that it's individualized. So uh, it acknowledges uh, individual differences, group differences, uh, and is 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 able to be flexible and adaptive. Uh, also, the flip side of individualized, this, uh, this idea of interdependence um, and being uh, in tune with others as well as in tune with ourselves. Uh, certainly, uh, this uh, uh, idealized, and I hate to use the word idealized because I, I don't really, um, well, I, I have problems with the, with the word ideal uh, at this stage of my life. I used to like the word, but um, I have some... Um, doubts about its, its, its value and meaning these days. Um, but in any case, this, this approach would be uh, both inspired and inspiring. Uh, uh, there would be a kind of infinite dimension to spirituality, the sense that uh, uh, we all come from an infinite ground of being uh, and that uh, growth and development is infinite. Um, and uh, that ultimately uh, spirituality is ineffable. And at the same time, we can uh, uh, express it uh, in our own limited way. And to acknowledge that any time we're speaking about spirit, as the, uh, the Kabbalists would say, as if it were possible, as if it were possible to really say anything about the divine, as if it were possible to conceptualize the divine, if it were possible to do diagrams of the divine, for example, the tree of life diagram, uh, as if it were possible to really know anything about the infinite. So um, we, all, we always have to remember that uh, whatever we say, whatever we understand uh, is just a metaphor, it's just a model, uh, is just really a, a pointing finger. But we can also... Uh, play with those uh, metaphors and models, and uh, we can sort of fine tune them. But ultimately, uh, we, uh, uh, we we always miss the mark. Um, but on the other hand, uh, all of those maps are part of the infinite too. So that's again another paradox. And um, I think that uh, more and more uh, people will engage in dialectical and paradoxical thinking. I think that that will be a, a feature um, of this uh, this spiritual that I'm talking about. Um, so to continue with my eyes, um, I think that um, uh, the spirituality will be imaginative. So there'll be uh, more, uh, more emphasis on the creative process. Um, uh, uh, I think it'll be uh, ideophoric so that there will be a, a kind of proliferation of ideas and images. For me, idolatry does not mean worshiping an idol. It means, uh, Worshiping the finite. So anytime we reduce the infinite to the finite in any possible way, whether it's our consumerism or our other addictions, whenever we treat the finite as the infinite, then we're engaging in idolatry. So I think uh, it's wonderful to proliferate ideas and images 
uh, and models and maps about the uh, the imponderable, uh, the unnameable. Um, uh, but we shouldn't get too stuck in any one map, in any one symbol, in any one image, in any one thought or teaching. Uh, for me, if we're really uh, engaged in the path, then we have to uh, be open to uh, continuing to develop new ideas, new approaches, new symbols, um, and not get stuck uh, on the past. So uh, another I, I was having a little trouble coming up with eyes, but incredible in the sense of beyond belief, uh, this idea that spirituality is not going to be uh, uh, based just in our beliefs, it's going to be based in experience, uh, uh, in spiritual experience, in spiritual knowing, uh, and at the same time, spiritual not knowing, and, and knowing that our knowing is really a not knowing, and that our not knowing is a knowing. Again, another paradox. Um, also incredible means to me this, this emphasis on awe and wonder, uh, and um, I, I'm hoping that uh, um, as, as uh, uh, humans uh, evolve as a species, that more and more people will open up to and embrace their own experience of, of awe and wonder. Uh, D.H. Lawrence said that wonder is the sixth sense, and he said that uh, even animals experience it. Um, and I think that there's probably many more than six senses. Uh, another I uh, is uh, intimacy. I think that uh, for me, spirituality is about intimacy, uh, intimacy with uh, one another, intimacy with the ground of being, uh, intimacy with our own being. So I think that that will uh, uh, be an important feature that I hope uh, uh, grows more. Also related to that is this notion of immediacy. Um, that we can have our own kind of immediate uh, experience of life, of one another, uh, of, of the divine. Um, and uh, so, much of, so much of our world is mediated, mediated by technology, uh, mediated by our uh, traditions, our, our learnings, and so on. And, of course, our lives will always be mediated, mediated by, uh, you know, the, the limits uh, um, and also gifts of our brains and bodies and so on. So um, those are all uh, mediating um, uh, factors. Um, there is no immediate uh, experience of reality. Everything is always uh, filtered uh, by our, the limits and shape of our sensory systems, our, uh, uh, our cognitive and, and perceptual systems, our, our uh, emotional systems and so on. So uh, we're always, uh, uh, drawing, we're, we're always experiencing some kind of energy uh, that we um, that we experience and understand and act on um, in in our own human ways. Uh, I mentioned this idea of, of interdependence, also interpenetrating. I think that there's this idea of uh, the sense of how uh, all the different uh, forces um, in the world are always interpenetrating. Uh, this this these interpenetra interpenetrating fields of energy. Um, I think uh, the kind of spirituality I'm talking about is involving. Uh, it, it involves us in life, um, uh, but it also it's also evolving. Not quite an I, but I, I, I couldn't, you know, read that out. It's also engaging, spelled with an E, but sounding like an I. Uh, and also enacting this idea that uh, spirituality leads to action, that it leads to uh, change uh, in the world. Uh, I was mentioning that emphasis in, in Judaism um, on the ma'asa, on, on the deed. Um, and uh, uh, what's interesting, I'll, I'll mention uh, that in, in Hebrew, the word for word is davar, okay? But davar is also a thing. So this idea that um, uh, words have a kind of... Uh, uh, presence and power like things, but also the idea the other way around, that things have an expressive power, that, that things speak, so it works both ways. And the last I that I'll mention, and there's certainly many, many other features of this uh, spirituality that uh, uh, um, I, I'm speaking about, but I decided to keep it to the eyes, um, and that's intrepid. Um, I, uh, I hope and, and pray that um, that uh, we'll all have the courage to uh, 
continue to explore and engage with uh, the ground of being with one another, with the earth, with the cosmos, uh, and with ourselves. Thank you.